Turbulent times for the watch market, are prices up or down? Any Rolexes started to appreciate in value once again? Are Tudor watches a flip or a pass fresh out of the AD? To wear or not to wear? Does it make much difference to value storing away an investment watch as a safe queen? And is it safe to pull the trigger on a Royal Oak? All of that next. This is Watch Dealer Question Time. Good evening, I'm Vinny, a watch dealer, and you join me today in the city of Manchester, UK. Here I have a selection of some of your questions most frequently asked and relevant to the current secondary watch market landscape. And unlike the original version of Question Time that prominently features politicians, I'm going to speak frankly and honestly and actually answer those questions directly. So let's get into it. The first question we have is, when will the watch market accelerate once again and values go up like they did in 2021 to early 2022? Firstly, I think we must remember that what happened back then was partly due to the economic situation. There was a lot of disposable income going around and also the booming landscape of cryptocurrency. It was obvious that there were new players on the secondary watch market, new entrants to the whole watch collecting luxury game, watch flipping game as well. And those entrants were guys who'd made a lot of money on cryptocurrency. And if that happens again, if we can see a situation where Bitcoin accelerates or other cryptocurrencies and people make a lot of money, then I'm sure the value of luxury goods in general and investment pieces in terms of watches will also follow suit. I think another situation that we could see that could uh, cause the secondary market to accelerate again is the lifting of the lockdowns in China. Of course, that's already happened. And I've already started to hear from viewers of the channel that in the Far East, it's becoming more competitive now, once again, at authorized dealers to pick up that Rolex, that stainless steel Rolex that everybody wants waiting lists are starting to grow and what I think that will possibly result in is Rolex potentially shifting allocation of supply to the Far East and therefore in Europe, in the United States, we'll have less watches available at the authorized dealers and what happens then is wait lists start to increase again and then people turn to the secondary market. So a lot of the acceleration of the secondary watch market values depends on what goes on at the authorized dealers and also depends on external economic factors. And on to the second question, I want to buy a Royal Oak. Everybody's talking about Rolex values stabilizing, but what about Audemars Piguet? In terms of the Royal Oak, I can say as a dealer inside the industry, the vast majority of dealers are not holding them in stock. Yet it still is the case where the Royal Oak uh, depreciated so much from a, I think the 15500 ST was a 55, 60,000 pound watch at one point with a blue dial. And now of course, they plummeted all the way down to 40,000. So there is still a lot of anxiety there from secondary watch market dealers who perhaps got their fingers burnt and lost money on inventory they were holding at the time of the market correction last year. And that's really still lingering. So the vast majority of APs that you will see for sale are either for sale privately or on consignment. I think everything really is linked to Rolex and the performance of Rolex. Once we start to see an acceleration or appreciation in values of Rolex on the secondary market, then other brands will slowly start to follow suit. Those brands follow Rolex's lead. So Rolex will be the first to fall and they will be the first to rise and everybody else will be lagged after that. So is it safe to pull the trigger on an AP Royal Oak right now? Well, to be quite honest with you, I don't personally see values of the standard Royal Oak 15500 or 15400 ST falling any more than they have. And the next question is, do you think Amiga will have anything up their sleeve to steal the limelight away from watches and wonders as they did in 2022 with the launch of the Moon Swatch? Now, first of all, we we have had a moon swatch this year that was the moon swatch moonshine gold and what a miserable release that was 
it was the most underwhelming release I think I can remember in a long time. All the anticipation and build up that was surrounding that, of course we've waited a year for one of the most interesting, exciting and groundbreaking watches that we've ever seen. A collaboration between a major brand and a sort of entry level Swiss brand. That was revolutionary in the watch industry. The designs that they brought out, the colours were incredible back in 2022. So quite rightly so, it did steal the limelight from watches and wonders that year. I think this year we've seen more of a play it safe corporate solution with the moonshine gold but maybe that might be a little bit of a smoking gun perhaps in the next few days we may see a shock release of an extravagant new design of a moon swatch because Amiga for some reason can't be bothered to turn up to watches and wonders it beats me as to why but hey I'll be there and Amiga, it is your loss that you don't get to meet me. Next question, <laughs> which Rolex watches have already started to go up in value once again since the market correction? Now I would say there is a few and this is just from me witnessing the sort of changes in prices for wholesale prices, what we are able to buy watches for on the secondary market and what other dealers are selling them for. And there are a few watches that some of them are linked to the pre-hype that always exists around watches and wonders. Of course, Milgauss values, the Z-Blue particularly has gone up slightly, maybe 10, 15%. The GMT Master 2 Sprite, I've mentioned this before as well. Some dealers are, are selling the Jubilee bracelet watch one now for 22, 23,000 pounds I've actually seen, uh, which is quite a lot given that, you know, they were down at 19, 20,000 only a couple of months ago. We've also seen a strengthening in those watches really that are the safe bets. So Submariner no dates, Submariner dates. The Submariner no date was, went all the way down to 10,000 pound. On the secondary market now, they sit at sort of 11, 11 and a half. But in terms of gold pieces and date just as well, They've remained pretty much the same over the last three or four months now. Which watch brands do dealers make the most money on? And is 10% a standard flat rate margin that dealers make across all brands? And the answer for this is absolutely not. Dealer margins do vary. I think the 10% I gave in that video mainly applied to the vast majority of dealers for stainless steel Rolex models. That's what they will aim for. It depends really on your location, on the size of the business, on whether you've got premises, the, the scale of your overheads that you've got to pay for. And also, of course, it does vary uh, in terms of brands. So Rolex actually is probably the, one of the least profitable brands. Brand new Rolex is one of the least profitable brands for watch dealers. For us at Beat the Waitlist, the most profitable are watches under the sort of seven, eight thousand pound selling price. So that mainly covers Amiga. You know, on some Amiga watches that we may sell for two or three thousand pounds, there may be a 20, 25 percent, even 30 percent margin on those. Why is that? Because a 10 percent margin on two thousand pounds. 200 pounds and then you've got your overheads that you've got to take off that it isn't worth getting out of bed for so margins have to be bigger on those lower ticket or sort of entry level swiss watches that we sell under the seven or eight thousand pound mark the other thing is as well of course on a four thousand pound amiga seamaster 300m we still have to potentially carry out a service for that, which means it's got to be sent off to our, our Amiga specialists. Now, of course, we get a lower price than we would if we sent it directly to Amiga, but still, you know, that's a £300 job there, and that doesn't differ too much to what we'd have to pay for a fifteen, twenty thousand pound Rolex. And then, of course, we've got to get a watch register certificate for that as well, which costs the same for any watch and time and money invested in photography and advertisement. So the same amount of time and effort and money goes into preparing those watches for sale at two or three thousand pounds as a Rolex at fifteen, twenty thousand pounds. Margins for gold pieces of Rolex might be as low as six or seven percent. It just depends on brand and on the price point. The next question is in relation to the Flip or Pass series of videos that we've recently done on the channel, and that concerns Tudor watches. The question is, what about Tudor watches? Are they a flip or a pass out of the AD? And I think generally the answer for this is they're a pass. Most uh, Tudor watches that we've seen released in the last year or two have come out with a considerable wait list, and that wait list can last up to six months. We saw it most recently with the Palagos 39. Yes, 
those lucky enough to get the phone call at the authorised dealer were buying those and flipping them on eBay for four or five hundred pounds more. So that was a nice profit. But I think generally Tudor watches in terms of their supply, that supply, that limited supply is artificial. Tudor can absolutely uh, satisfy the demand for those watches, but they do it artificially because they want their watches to be, you know, demand to exceed the supply. Of course, that only elevates the image of their brand. The Tudor Palagos 39 is now uh, selling for end user four or five hundred pounds under the retail price and that is just six months on from the massive hype there was surrounding that watch and you could not get one at all from the authorized dealer so of course there are individuals getting that phone call now for the Palagos 39 they will probably will still pull that trigger believing that they can sell it and make a profit as was the situation a few months ago don't do that only buy the watch if you really want it because if you come to offer it to me you will lose money and the final question concerns storing investment watches away does it make much difference to value keeping a watch that you've only lightly worn and there isn't really that much evidence of wear or storing it away and having it in absolutely perfect mint condition and never having been worn on the wrist now i think this is really relative depending to the watch that we're talking about the question comes in from a viewer that is referring to the platinum daytona should i store this watch as a safe queen because i've seen on chrono 24 that lightly worn models are trading at twenty thousand pound below what unworn models are with rarer pieces like that where there isn't that much evidence I think data available to price a watch, of course, you know, those dealers who haven't got that much to go off will price that at more than what they can see a lightly will watch for. But in terms of what is that watch actually selling for on the secondary market at the end of the day, maybe not quite that much more. I don't think 20,000 pounds they would achieve that. It's more relevant, I think, with watches that have been discontinued though. So. We've seen that there, the gap between discontinued Rolex Submariner Hulks that are completely unworn, the gap between values of those is, is widening versus values of those that are worn because obviously as time goes on, there's less and less of them for sale. Anyway guys, I hope you've enjoyed this edition of Watch Dealer Question Time. We will be doing this again, so please, if you have any questions, anything watch market related or watch related, put it down in the comments below and I will do my very best in the next edition to answer them frankly, honestly and directly. Go check out beattheweightlist-watches.com and I'll see you next time. Take care.